Hello, good evening. Welcome everyone to the 2021 Diabesity Masterclass Series. We're up to week 11 and tonight's topic is management of heart and kidney comorbidity. My name is Charles Broadfoot and I'm one of the professional development officers with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. I would firstly like to acknowledge the First Peoples and traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and those emerging. I would firstly like to thank and acknowledge the series partners uh, and these include Western Sydney Diabetes, local health districts and primary health networks from Western Sydney, Nepean Blue Mountains, Southwest Sydney and Hunter New England Central Coast. Also Blacktown Metabolic and Weight Loss Program, Agency for Clinical Innovation, My Interact and National Associations of Diabetes Centres. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the series sponsors in alphabetical order. They are Abbott, AstraZeneca, BD, Boehringer Ingelheim, Inova Pharmaceuticals, Lilly, MSD, Nestle, Novo Nordisk and Sanofi. For feedback purposes, we are asking all participants to complete a feedback survey where you'll be issued with a certificate of attendance, which you can then use to claim your CPD points. Uh, My Interact will send you a link to the feedback form after tonight's event. However, you can also access it on their app under the event tab. And I will also post uh, the link to the survey in the Q&A tab at the end of the session tonight. So you won't receive your certificate immediately. So please allow up to a week to receive it, um, but please also remember to refresh your app um, so that updates come through. The Diabesity Masterclass Series activity can be logged on your CPD dashboard on RSCGP if you're a GP. Um, you just need to click on the quick log button to record the activity once you're logged in. Uh, the session is being recorded and the recordings, uh, the previous recordings for the whole series are available in the My Interact portal. Um, this recording for tonight will be available from tomorrow and it'll also be available in our PHN's education library on our website and they'll be available from tomorrow. So tonight we are using Slido for your questions. So you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, the Q&A tab if you're accessing from a computer or laptop. Um, alternatively, you can head to slido.com. So that's S-L-I-D-O and enter our event code DM2. So that stands for Diabetes Masterclass and then the number two. Or a third option is by scanning that QR code uh, that you will see has popped up on your screen. Um, please type your questions in throughout the presentation, but please know we have allocated time after that for um, a panel discussion with our speakers where you can um, ask any burning questions you might have. We've got plenty of time to go through these. If you would like to make your presentation full screen tonight, um, you can click the expand button and you can find that in the right, bottom right hand, kind of, right hand corner of the video. Um, but just note, you will need to exit the full screen to take you back to the screen with the Q&A tab if you'd like to ask a question. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator and speakers. Our facilitator is Dr. Michelle Redford, and Michelle is a general practitioner and the quality improvement lead at Black Butt Doctors in Newcastle. Michelle is also a GP advisor to the Hunter New England Integrated Care Partnership. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, Associate Professor Sham Acharya, who is an endocrinologist, um, he's unwell tonight and he's unable to join us. Our main speaker tonight is Associate Professor Bobby Chaco. Bobby is the Director of Nephrology and Transplantation at John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle. He also serves as the Chair for the New South Wales ACT Renal Advanced Training Recruitment Committee and is a member of the New South Wales Transplant Advisory Committee. He has published over 40 papers in peer-reviewed journals, is the Principal Investigator for many ongoing clinic trials in nephrology, including serving as the National Leader for an IGA nephropathy clinical trial. He has an interest, he has an active interest in the diabetic kidney disease, IGA nephropathy and renal transplant. He holds a conjoint appointment at the University of Newcastle and is passionate about medical education and clinical research. So that's all from me. I'll now hand over to you, Dr. Chaco, to introduce yourself and then we'll launch your presentation. Thanks very much. <laughs> 
Thank you, Charles. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Thank you for attending. So as Charles alluded to, my name is Bobby Chaco. I'm the Director of Renal Services at the John Hunter Hospital, and I'm pleased to represent the Hunter New England LHD at this Diabetes Masterclass 2021. So the topic for today would be on cardiorenal crosstalk in diabetes, and uh, Todd will now upload my presentation. And I'm sure we'll have a, a healthy discussion at the end of this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Charles, and thanks, Todd. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. My name is Bobby Chaco. I'm the Director of Regional Services at the John Hunter Hospital. I'm proud to represent the Hunter New England LHD in this Diabetes Masterclass in 2021. The topic for today is on cardiorenal crosstalk in diabetes. So let's look at the objectives for today's session. First and foremost, to recognize the CKD, CVD, and diabetes link. How to screen for patients for CKD and CVD in diabetes. How to manage CKD and CVD in diabetes with the ultimate objective being for me to impress upon you to accept the paradigm shift in the management of diabetes. So let's set the stage by looking at the state of play. Globally, 463 million people are living with diabetes. That number is expected to rise to 700 million by 2045. Type 2 diabetes approximately doubles the risk of death, and it's estimated that diabetes caused 4.2 million deaths in 2019. Cardiovascular disease is the principal cause of death in type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is associated with significant loss of life. As you can see here, on an average, a 50-year-old with diabetes but no history of vascular disease is at least six years younger at time of death than a counterpart without diabetes. Diabetes confers significant cardiovascular risk, and these graphs here show the rate of fatal cardiovascular events in men and women of increasing ages according to the presence of diabetes and or prior MI. So this would be the risk in someone who has no diabetes or no prior MI. The risk with diabetes, with prior MI, but when you have diabetes and prior MI, that risk significantly increases. In fact, that risk is present even before the diagnosis of diabetes. The ticking clause clock hypothesis actually shows this. This is a paper from 2002 that looked at women throughout the stages of diabetes and the risk for MI and stroke. Those that remain non-diabetic throughout the study had the lowest risk. Those that were diabetic at baseline had considerably higher risk and we're not surprised with this. But the risk of an event prior to the diagnosis of diabetes and the risk of an event just immediately after the diagnosis of diabetes is considerably higher. So these findings suggest that aggressive management of cardiovascular risk factor is warranted in individuals at increased risk for diabetes. When you develop kidney disease and diabetes, it's a serious matter. Approximately 30% of patients with type 1 diabetes and approximately 40% with type 2 diabetes could develop kidney disease. Diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage kidney disease worldwide. And it's no different in Australia, wherein about 38% of all causes of end-stage kidney disease are attributed to diabetes. Most of the diabetes-associated excess cardiovascular risk that I was talking to you about occurs in those patients with CKD. As nephrologists, we are focused in preventing our patients with CKD reaching end-stage kidney disease that would require dialysis or transplantation. But the fact is only 10% reach here. It's not because as nephrologists, we are doing a great job. It's because 90% of them actually die before they reach this stage of end-stage kidney disease. At least 50% of these die from cardiovascular death and a further one third from infection. A fact that's going to assume greater importance in the COVID era. 
So for every one patient with CKD who progressed to end-stage kidney disease, 20 of them die from cardiovascular death. Renal disease is associated with increased all-cause mortality. And this paper by Marcelo Tonelli in Lancet illustrates this. The risk of a patient who has diabetes and CKD causing all-cause mortality is in fact higher than a patient who has got previous myocardial infarction. So much so, the author suggests that CKD could be added to the list of criteria defining people at the highest risk of future coronary events. Now, I don't think I have to tell you that if you have diabetic kidney disease, depending on when you contract it, you lose a fairly large chunk of your life. And in fact, it shortens your life expectancy on average by 16 years. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female, it is an equal opportunity killer. So just keep that in mind as a perspective as we talk about slowing progression. And in fact, this is something not many patients are aware of. I'm sharing with you an old data from 2004, but it makes the point that once you have stage 3B CKD, your cardiovascular risk goes up by 11 fold and your all-cause mortality goes up by fivefold. And that's just stage 3B CKD. Look what happens in stage four and five. Again, I suppose you as GPs know this already, but I wanted to put some numbers to impress upon the real impact of what can be done. CKD has implication. We have learned that it is a potent risk factor for cardiovascular mortality and for end-stage kidney disease. So compared to normal GFR, as your GFR drops, your cardiovascular mortality increases and your risk for developing end-stage kidney disease increases. But there is one risk factor here that actually modifies that risk, and that is albuminuria. You can see here, this blue shaded area is a urinase here of less than three, green between three and 30, and red more than 30. So the highest risk is seen in those with macroalbuminuria. So reducing albuminuria by RAS blockers or agents like HGLT2 inhibitors has an impact not only on kidney disease, but also on cardiovascular mortality. If there's one slide that should wake you up from your slumber, this should be it. This is the life expectancy of a 60 year old man today with no diabetes, with diabetes, you take off six years of your life, with diabetes and MI, further 12 years. And if you have a combination of diabetes, CKD and MI, then you're looking at taking off between 20 to 24 years of your life. So what is the CKD CVD diabetes link? And that is, if your patient with diabetes develops CKD and CKD becomes a disease multiplier, so you can't treat these diseases in their own little silo. Shared treatment goals and management is required. You need to think of all three diseases when you manage diabetes. So let's look at the pathophysiology a little bit more closely here. You're familiar with this and just let's refresh ourselves, the macrovascular and the microvascular complications of type two diabetes. The macrovascular complications are stroke and heart disease, Microvascular complications are retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. And the key manifestations of cardiovascular disease besides the coronary artery disease is heart failure, stroke, and peripheral arterial disease. Endothelial dysfunction is the earliest vascular abnormality and will precede other known cardiovascular risk factors. It worsens in parallel with aggravation of organ damage in patients with diabetes, endothelial damage can be caused by insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, and low-grade systemic inflammation. Microalbuminuria, you know, is a marker for CKD leading to end-stage kidney failure. And the reason for me to put up this slide here is to suggest that microalbuminuria is not only a marker for CKD, but is a marker for endothelial dysfunction. So microalbuminuria indicates considerable renal damage and is a marker for widespread endothelial injury 
which explains why the presence of microalbuminuria greatly increases the likelihood of renal, cardiovascular, renal and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. This slide shows the sections through a vessel illustrating the development of an atherosclerotic plaque. And why am I showing this here? Type one and type two diabetes have been shown to accelerate the development of atherosclerosis. Several pathophysiological mechanisms have been described through which diabetes increase the risk of cardiovascular events. For example, oxidative stress, inflammation, insulin resistance, and vasculopenia. They lead to increased rates of atherosclerotic events, which is an important cause of cardiovascular death. These mechanisms are also critical in promoting increased rates of heart failure. And in fact, heart failure is an increasingly recognized risk factor in people with diabetes. Furthermore, diabetes affects the kidney and we now learn quite clearly that renal disease is an important risk amplifier for atherosclerotic events as well as for heart failure. The point being that cardiovascular disease in a diabetic patient is actually a collusion of several factors besides hyperglycemia, such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, diffuse endothelial dysfunction, hypercoagulability, and inflammation. We know that in type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, including heart failure and CKD, are overlapping. So, for example, CKD affects approximately 50% of patients with people with type 2, so 50% of people with type 2 diabetes. Approximately one in five patients with CKD will also have heart failure. And the presence of CKD in patients with heart failure increases the risk of mortality. We also know that in patients with diabetes, approximately one in three have cardiovascular disease and they have an increased risk of heart failure as well, which exponentially increases the risk of cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. So the cardiorenal crosstalk in diabetes simply means dysfunction of the heart, kidneys, or metabolism contributes to the dysfunction of the others. Often we get caught up by looking at the GFR alone. And this slide, which represents the pathophysiology of a diabetic kidney disease, will illustrate this. At the onset of diabetes, or maybe even just before the onset of diabetes, is heralded by a stage of hyperfiltration where the whole kidney GFR can go up to 180 mils per minute. You won't pick this up in your regular bloods because your eGFR is only going to be given at more than 90. Strict control of HP1C and initiation of treatments like RAS blockers and agents like SGLT2 inhibitors can mitigate this hyperfiltration process. Now, the whole kidney GFR may remain normal even in the presence of considerable nephron mass. So at 100% nephron mass, you can have a GFR of 120. At 50% nephron mass, you still have a GFR of 50. So if your GFR cannot tell you what exactly is going on in your kidney, what else can we depend on? That's where the urine albuminuria comes into play. So assessing the urine ACR may help identify the extent of subclinically inflicted loss of nephron mass. So let's go on to the screening aspect of cardio kidney diabetes you and your patients should recognize that CKD is generally asymptomatic. Up to 90% of your kidney functions may be lost before symptoms are present. Patients with diabetes should be screened annually for diabetic kidney disease. It is recommended that the initial screening should commence five years from the diagnosis of type one diabetes and from diagnosis of type two diabetes. Screening should include measurement of urinary albumin creatinine ratio in a spot urine sample and measurement of serum creatinine, which then gives you the estimation of GFR. Timed urine protein estimation, 24 hour urine protein, 24 hour creatinine clearance are no longer recommended. So 
Testing for CKD or diabetic kidney disease in diabetes is based on the premise that kidney disease has no warning signs. So you will have to rely on what we call as the kidney health check that looks at your blood test for the GFR, urine test for the proteinuria and the blood pressure. And depending on your GFR and albuminuria, it'll be useful to mark these numbers on the kidney heat map, which in my view is a very effective way to engage and communicate with your patient. For example, if the GFR is more than 90, but if the urine ACR is more than 25, you can tell your patient that your ACR levels are very high. And though your functions are normal, you are in the red zone and you may want to see a nephrologist. Diabetic kidney disease is defined as a urinary ACR of more than three milligram per millimole and or a GFR of less than 60 mils per minute. We don't depend upon proteinuria alone to diagnose diabetic kidney disease. If your GFR is less than 60 in a diabetic patient that also constitute diabetic kidney disease. Once you have marked the stage of CKD, then I am, would recommend that you go through the managing CKD in primary care resources that's available on the kidney.org.au website. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this. The fourth edition was released last year. And then you have the yellow, orange, and the red clinical action plan, which tells you what you should do. When would you send a patient to a nephrologist? Kidney Health Australia would recommend that a urinary ACR of more than 30 or an estimated GFR of less than 30 would mandate a referral to a nephrologist. So a useful guide is to remember the number 30. Heart health check is not as straightforward as kidney health check because we don't screen for asymptomatic patients for heart disease. So you will rely on clinical examination and laboratory finding. Clinical examination would include blood pressure, checking the patient's weight. Laboratory examination would be checking the lipid profile, blood sugar, family history, diet, exercise, and smoking. Once we assess this, you're expected to use the Australian Absolute Cardiovascular Disease Risk Calculator to identify or stratify the patient's risk. This risk calculator takes into account the patient's age, gender, blood pressure, smoking status, lipid profile, diabetes, and ECG changes. As you can see here, EGFR or neither the EGFR nor the urine ACR is taken into account, which in my view is also an important factor to be considered whilst assessing cardiovascular risk in patients with diabetes. So all patients with type two diabetes should be assessed for absolute cardiovascular risk using a validated tool at diagnosis. And you need to reassess them at the following intervals. For those with low risk every two years, moderate risk for every six to 12 months, and those with high risk as clinically indicated. So when you look at screening for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, checking for lipids, checking your blood pressure is fine. But unlike the kidney disease, where you're expected to check the GFR and ACR for all patients with diabetes, screening asymptomatic patients for coronary artery disease with a calcium score or for heart failure using echocardiogram and BNP are currently not recommended. Of course, you'll keep a low threshold in those with smoking, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and CKD. We come to the final segment of cardio kidney diabetes management. Management of kidney disease and diabetes will focus on hyperglycemia, hypertension, reduction of proteinuria, weight loss, smoking cessation, avoiding non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, and avoiding situations where you could lead to an acute and chronic kidney injury 
like the use of contrast agents. Management of cardiovascular disease in diabetes almost mirrors that of CKD with the exception that lipid control, antiplatelet therapy and exercise are more prominent. Let's look at the RACGP targets. You're familiar with this? Let's revise this. HPA1C target should be less than 7%. Your LDL cholesterol should be less than two. Your blood pressure should be generally less than 140 over 90 and a urine ACR in women less than 3.5 and in men less than 2.5. If you look at the lipid control alone, the target LDL cholesterol is less than two, but if patient has established cardiovascular disease, the target should be less than 1.8. Statins are indicated for people with diabetes at high risk of cardiovascular disease at any cholesterol level. Statin therapy is recommended for all patients with established cardiovascular disease. The role of fibrates like phenofibrate or gemfibrosil to decrease cardiovascular disease is contentious. But you could use them in addition to a statin or on their own if they are intolerant to statin when fasting triglycerides are more than 2.3 or HDL cholesterol is low. What about antithrombotic therapy? Antiplatelet therapy, namely aspirin or clopidogrel, are not usually recommended for primary prevention. It's reserved for secondary prevention only. And again, the risk needs to be weighed against patients' risks. What about atrial fibrillation? In non-valvular atrial fibrillation, evidence for anticoagulation in CKD4 and 5 are weak. Nonetheless, NOACs are preferred over warfarin in CKD. Rivaroxabam, 15 milligrams daily, is TGA approved for a GFR up to 15. But again, the risk benefit needs to be weighed for each patient. Blood pressure targets in diabetes, as a general rule, the target should be less than 140 over 90. But you will look at getting the blood pressure down to 130 over 80 in younger patients or those with high cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease risk. In kidney disease, there's no doubt the blood pressure should be below 130 over 80. And it's recommended that home blood pressure monitoring is used before commencing treatment. Most randomized controlled trials have demonstrated unequivocally the treatment of hypertension to a blood pressure target of below 140 over 90 does risk reduce cardiovascular events in patients with diabetes. However, the effect of more intensive blood pressure control on cardiovascular outcomes in diabetes is variable. Hypertension is a modifiable risk factor for GFR decline in diabetes. We know that albuminuria was the strongest predictor and the fastest decline was seen in those patients with the highest blood pressure. These data were strong enough to recommend the use of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. And the data goes back to two decades, the renal trial and the IDNT trial. The renal trial looked at losartan, whilst the IDNT trial looked at erbosartan and amlodipin. And they've used this in patients with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease, looking at the effect on CKD progression. And they found that losartan reduced the risk by 16% and herbosartan reduced the risk by about 20%. But the effect was purely on CKD progression, had no benefits on cardiovascular mortality or death. But at the end of 48 months, the residual risk was quite significant, approximately 40% in both groups. Despite the modest benefit that these agents provided, this was still good enough for all guidelines to recommend the use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in all patients with type 2 diabetes and hypertension, regardless of the presence of proteinuria. Sadly, the use of RAS blockers remain underutilized. This paper published in 2019, looking at 
two large US healthcare systems have demonstrated that even in the most recent quartile of 2014 to 2017, the use of ACE inhibitors and ARB remain low. In population where diabetes and CKD and hypertension, where the use of these agents are almost mandated, the uptake was only at about 25%. And we see that same process happening in locally as well. This data from the Diabetes Alliance by Shama Chari and his group showed that patients with the highest risk category, namely those with a blood pressure of more than 140 over 90 or an elevated urine ACR, only 40% of your patients were actually receiving this drug. So as alluded to, the target blood pressure in a patient with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease is below 130 over 80. I mentioned here to maximize the use of an ACE inhibitor on ARB preferentially over other agents. What do I mean by this? You can achieve a target of 130 over 80 by using 10 milligrams of amlodipine and 5 milligrams of pedendopril. But in the interest of cardiorenal benefit, you may want to use 10 milligrams of perindopril and five milligrams of amlodipine to reach your target of 130 over 80. It will be remiss of me not to mention the ABCD or blood pressure control. The first line agent for the management of hypertension, regardless of your indication, is an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, but not together. B stands for beta blockers, and we do not use beta blockers for the primary management of hypertension. Beta blockers are exclusively limited to those patients with heart failure or coronary artery disease. But having said that, if your patient is already on a beta blocker, you don't want to take them off quickly. Your third agent is a calcium channel blocker. and Your fourth agent is a diuretic. So the algorithm would be that you start with A, and if the blood pressure is not controlled, you go to, you add on a C, the blood pressure is not controlled, then you add on a D. If after these three agents have been used in the appropriate complement and your blood pressures remain high, you could use a fourth agent, namely spiractin or spinalactone, or alternatively, refer the patient to a nephrologist. The recommendations for the treatment of confirmed hypertension in people with diabetes is illustrated here. If your blood pressure or initial blood pressure is more than 140 over 90 and less than 160 over 100, you can start with one agent. But if your initial blood pressure is more than 160 over 100 after confirming this at home, then you will need to start with two agents straight away. Some of the recommended combinations and uh, caution are shown here. So ACE inhibitors and ARB and a calcium channel blocker or ACE inhibitor and ARB or a thiazide diuretic are your standard drugs. But you will avoid combination of diltiazem and a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor and ARB with a potassium sparing diuretic. Similarly, the use of thiazide diuretic in a younger population, um, you may want to avoid A, for the risk of gout and B, for the risk of metabolic syndrome. However, if you feel that the blood pressure control can only be achieved by adding on a thiazide diuretic, go for it. But avoid using beta blockers as your first line agents for the management of hypertension. The cornerstone treatments of cardiovascular disease and kidney disease and diabetes in the past have relied on risk factor management, using ACE inhibitors and ARB, and heavily focused on glycemic control with agents like metformin, sulfonylurea, and insulin. Were we doing the right thing? Perhaps not, because multiple trials have shown from the ACCORD trial, the advanced trial, the UKPDS trial, that intensive glycemic control had only limited benefit as far as major cardiovascular events are concerned, and in fact had no effect on all-cause mortality. Studies going back to the STENO trial have shown that intensive but multifactorial control of cardiovascular risk factors reduce cardiovascular risk in patients with type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> 
And that multifactorial management includes blood pressure, lipid lowering, glucose control, and individualized diet and lifestyle. But that's not to say that glycemic control is not important. If you look at the effect of reducing glycemia on micro and macrovascular complications, lowering HbA1c does reduce the risk of microvascular disease like kidney and eye disease, does reduce the effect of neuropathy, though this takes several years, also reduces macrovascular disease, but the effect is only modest. As we have learned, macrovascular disease is the major cause of morbidity and mortality in type 2 diabetes. So you could argue focusing on glycemic control alone means we have perhaps barking at the wrong tree. Meta-analysis of intensive glucose lowering trials have shown the benefit of different intervention on cardiovascular outcomes. You're more likely to achieve better cardiovascular outcomes if you're able to reduce your blood pressure by four millimeter reduce your LDL cholesterol by one compared to a HbA1c below 0.9% for your patient. So you could argue that the standard of care in the past has been on focused on glycemic control alone. Somehow organ protection and preventing death has been an afterthought. So essentially when we think about the cardiorenal spectrum in people with diabetes, we should think about the pump that is heart failure, the pipes that's major adverse cardiovascular events and the filter that's renal events. And these three tend to occur either independently or coincidentally with each other in patients with diabetes with a lot of crosstalk between these three endpoints. And in fact, it's this background and the richness of the clinical trial data set that has led to a change in clinical practice guidelines. To set the stage for this, we really have what some has called an embarrassment of riches in this space now. It really has been unbelievable how quickly SGLT2 inhibitors have emerged in the landscape to treat people with type two diabetes, then patients with heart failure with and without diabetes, CKD with type two diabetes and CKD with and without type two diabetes. The timeline from 2015 to now have shown how quickly these advances have occurred. First, starting with the cardiovascular outcome trials. So it really has been an amazing time of innovations. And now is the time to move from evidence to implementation. Evidence is there. Now we must get it to the patient who can benefit. If you look at the SGLT2 inhibitors, that these agents, the cardiovascular outcome trials rather, was configured in patients with diabetes to prove the safety of these agents. But what they showed was not only were they safe, they were actually beneficial. They were reduced, they were able to reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events like three-point mace, heart failure, and CV death. Secondary endpoints showed that they were able to reduce macroalbuminuria and prevented the decline in GFR to ESRD. And these benefits, both cardiovascular benefits and renal benefits, were present even in patients with pre-existing CKD. If you look at the class effect of SGLT2 inhibitors on cardiac outcomes, we find that the effect was predominantly on heart failure or reducing death from heart failure. The effect on MACE was not as significant. All of the SGLT2 inhibitors, the dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, empagliflozin, and uh, again, canagliflozin showed a significant effect on heart failure and death from heart failure. If you look at the renal benefits, what was astounding was that these benefits were even better when compared to cardiovascular benefits. The relative risk reduction for a renal endpoint was between 40 to 46%. And if you could recall from the renal trial and the IDNT trial, we were happy with 16 to 20% risk reduction. We are seeing here at least three times the risk reduction of compared to 
uh, RAS blocker. What about the GLP-1 receptor agonist? Again, they showed safety and also benefits in diabetes. They were able to reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, predominantly atherosclerotic events. They reduced macroalbuminuria. They reduced EGFR decline. And like SGLT2 inhibitor, the benefits were seen even in patients with pre-existing CKD. If you look at the forest plot for GLP-1 receptor agonist, as far as cardiovascular outcomes were concerned, you see that their predominant benefit was on MACE. They too reduced all-cause death, but the effect for heart failure was not as significant for compared to SGLT2 inhibitor. The renal outcomes for GLP-1 receptor agonist was also quite encouraging. However, if you look at a head-to-head -head comparison between SGLT2 inhibitor and GLP receptor, GLP-1 receptor agonist from a renal outcomes, we find that SGLT2 inhibitor had a much significant renal re risk reduction at 45% compared to 13% with GLP-1 receptor agonist. One would argue that the 13% is still better than insulin. Therefore, the cornerstone treatment of cardiovascular disease and kidney disease in diabetes today, besides risk factor management, besides ACE inhibitor and ARB, will and should include SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. These agents do have their own little problems. This is a summary of risk mitigation strategies for SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonist. With SGLT2 inhibitors, genital mycotic infections could be seen. So you need to stress on hygiene. Remember, pee, rinse, wipe. Keep a lookout for volume depletion. Proactively reduce the dose of diuretics. Hold SGLT2 inhibitors during illness. Implement the sick day protocol. You're familiar with the SADMANS uh, acronym. I will talk about DK in the next few slides. If you look at the GLP-1 receptor agonist, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea are seen predominantly if you start off with the higher dose straight away. So patient education on tolerability and also starting on a low dose would make sense. TK and SGLT inhibitors. It's a common question that comes up and a reason why some are fearful of using SGLT inhibitor. I want to stress that SGLT2 inhibitors do not cause DKA. What SGLT2 inhibitors does is that they can mask DKA and in some circumstances may lessen the threshold to develop DKA. So what can be done clinically? Because the only things that cause DKA is missing insulin and excess glucagon. So if someone needs insulin, give them insulin. Be cautious with insulin dose reduction. Do not hold insulin in acute illness. Hold SGLT2 inhibitors during acute illness. Don't use in type 1 diabetes. The second most problem is EGFR decline after SGLT2 inhibitor initiation. In clinical practice, and I acknowledge this, SGLT2 inhibitor prescribers are yourself, frequently non-nephrologist, who may be uncomfortable watching the serum creatinine rise in response to initiating these agents. These early declines or dips were typically observed at two to four weeks after the initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors with subsequent partial recovery of the GFR curve by about 12 weeks and ultimately followed by an attenuation of the slope of GFR decline compared to the placebo group. So how can you reconcile early dips in eGFR with long-term nephroprotection? For that, I think you should understand the pathophysiology of diabetic kidney disease as illustrated here. <clears throat> 
What happens in patients with diabetes is that you have efferent arteriolar vasoconstriction and afferent arteriolar vasodilatation. SGL, sorry, RAS blockers reverse the efferent arteriolar vasoconstriction, which reduces the glomerular hypertension, reduces the hyperfiltration, and reduces proteinuria. SGL2 inhibitors acts on the efferent limb and as a consequence, reduce the glomerular hypertension, reduce hyperfiltration, and therefore proteinuria. So you can only imagine when you use these agents together, your glomerular hypertension reduces, and therefore the GFR drops. So if you could recall my initial slide about the pathophysiology of diabetic kidney disease, you can see this phase of the hyperfiltration that I spoke to you about. And what SGLT2 inhibitors does is basically we are reducing this hyperfiltration and changing the patient from an abnormally and pathophysiologically high GFR towards a more normal GFR. We are simply resetting the kidney filtration rate towards more normal. In the long term, this will protect the kidney. This fact has been illustrated in this paper published this year where they asked us to look at the tortoise and the hare from the Aesop's fable. So the race against end-stage kidney disease is a marathon, not a sprint. So you start a patient on an SGL2 inhibitor, there is a dip in the GFR, you panic, you stop the, you stop the drug, the patient panics and the patient will never go back on this drug again. But if you are perseverant and explain to the patient what exactly is happening here, and you persevere with the drug, that's how your drop in GFR will look like. As opposed to if you take the patient off the SGL2 inhibitor, that's how you drop your GFR. And that's potentially an additional 15 years of freedom from end-stage kidney disease. So we ought to be patient and persistent, much like the tortoise in the Aesop's fable, and set our eyes on the critical clinical outcomes, notably preventing end-stage kidney disease and preventing cardiovascular events. We would therefore advocate resisting the urge to stop SGL2 inhibitor when faced with an early modest dip in GFR. More often than not, this GFR dip is an acute event and should be reversed. And even if it's not fully reversed, clinicians like yourself should avoid the urge to discontinue this agent. Ultimately, the prevention of kidney failure and cardiovascular events should take precedence over excursions in serum creatinine. How does a clinician respond when faced with an abrupt rise in serum creatinine after initiating an SGLT2 inhibitor? Although the data as mentioned would suggest that most of the dips are merely an expected hemodynamic change of limited clinical relevance, it is essential to recognize that in some cases, this may signal systemic illness. So you check the patient's labs in four weeks, and you find a serum creatinine increase of more than 30%. Look at the volume status, the patient is volume depleted, then you need to hold back the diuretics See if the patient is acidotic, then you might be dealing with a euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. The overarching goal is to maintain patients on therapy by addressing the non SGLT2 inhibitor factors that might have precipitated the acute drop in GFR. What does the future hold for this landscape? In addition to SGL2 inhibitor, in addition to GLP-1 receptor agonist, we are now encouraged by the use of mineral corticoid receptor antagonist in this field. You're familiar with these agents of spinolactone, but unlike the spinolactone, the Fidelio and the Figario trial using an agent called Finrinone has demonstrated substantial improvement both for cardiovascular and renal outcomes without the added problem of hyperkalemia. Uh, 
So after years of stagnation, we now have a new paradigm in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease and renal disease in patients with type 2 diabetes, where organ protection is more important than glycemic control. So I suppose you will agree with me that even though elevated blood glucose levels are often seen as di defining diabetes, it is more than just a metabolic disease. You heard from me that diabetes also affects the cardiovascular system and the kidneys. Consequently, effective management of type 2 diabetes must address not only hyperglycemia, but also cardiovascular and renal complications of diabetes. What we need really is holistic multidisciplinary approach, which is reflected in the latest KDGO guidelines. So KDGO stands for Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. And what these guidelines mention is that for all patients with type 2 diabetes, you need to focus on glycemic control, blood pressure control, lipid management, exercise, nutrition, and smoking cessation. Most of your patients will need to be on a RAS blocker and SGL2 inhibitor regardless of glycemic control. So how do you go about initiating uh, these agents in patients with type 2 diabetes. So after lifestyle therapy, your first agent is metformin. The dose should be reduced if the GFR is less than 45 and discontinue if the GFR is less than 30. The purpose of using metformin is for glycemic control. If your patient has got kidney problems and regardless of your glycemic control, you're expected to start these patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor. If the EGFR is less than 30, do not initiate SGLT2 inhibitor. Remember, SGLT2 inhibitor is used for organ protection and not for glycemic control. If for some reason, the patient cannot tolerate SGLT2 inhibitor or the agent is contraindicated, the GLP-1 receptor agonist is the preferred option to protect the kidney. Now, what if they are already on anti-hyperglycemic therapy? What considerations do I have then? That's entirely going to depend on what therapies they are on. If they are on sulfonylureas or insulin, then there is a potential for hypoglycemia. So check the HbA1c. If the HbA1c is more than eight, chances are that there is enough cushion to prevent hyperglycemia in which case you stop, sorry, in which case you continue SGLT2 inhibitor. However, if the HP1C is less than 8%, then you may want to discontinue sulfonylureas, but you do not stop insulin. You reduce the insulin by not more than 20% to prevent DKA. And remember, all this is applicable only in those patients with a GFR of more than 45. If you are introducing SGL2 inhibitor for a patient who has a GFR of less than 45, it's unlikely to be impacting on glycemic outcome. Brace yourself for this. The KDGO or the kidney guidelines recommend a reversible decline in the GFR after commencing an SGL2 inhibitor may occur and is generally not an indication to discontinue therapy. Nephrologists are telling you this, do not stop the drug. Once an SGLT2 inhibitor is initiated, it is reasonable to continue this agent even if the GFR falls below 30 until dialysis is reached. These facts are also recommended, are reflected rather in the ADA guidelines of 2021, where the focus is not on glycemic control, but prevention of complications and optimizing quality of life. So your first line therapy is metformin, after and along with comprehensive lifestyle changes. Once you initiated your patient with diabetes, from here on, you are expected to look for indicators for high risk or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, or heart failure. What is an example of a high risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Age more than 55 with coronary artery disease, carotid artery disease, or lower extremity artery stenosis. 
of more than 50% or left ventricular hypertrophy. If this is the case, you should start these patients either on SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. The patient has got heart failure, then you should use SGLT2 inhibitor. If the patient has got kidney disease, you should use SGLT2 inhibitor. Only if that your patient do not have these risk factors or established kidney disease or heart failure, then your algorithm moves this way. And that would depend on what your compelling reason for using this agent should be. So for example, if the compelling need is to minimize hypoglycemia, you can still use GLP-1 receptor agonist or HGL2 inhibitor. If your compelling need is to reduce weight, then again, you can use GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitor. If cost is a major issue, then you might have to rely on sulfonurias. The Australian guidelines also reflect this. This is the living evidence for diabetes consortium, which recommend that after metformin, your first line agent should be SGLT2 inhibitor. And only in those patients who are intolerant or contraindicated to the use of SGLT2 inhibitor should you go on to GLP-1 receptor agonist. These agents recommend against the use of sulfonylureas again as the first line for glycemic management and also recommend against the use of pioglitazone. However, the RACGP diabetes medication algorithm is a bit different. This algorithm would suggest that metformin should be your first line, and then you need to check your HB1C. Only if the HB1C is not achieved, can you then move to the second line or the third line. So this is much different from the guidelines that I have mentioned to you about. And I acknowledge this, this is going to be a problem. So your likely agents are going to be metformin, SGLT2 inhibitor, and DPP4 or insulin. Um, you can't use a GLP-1 receptor agonist and an SGLT2 inhibitor together. Neither can you use an GLP-1 receptor agonist along with insulin with the exception of Biata. So as mentioned, I acknowledge that these could be barriers and I'm sure Sham Acharya will help us navigate PBS in the Q&A session. What about glycemic targets and cardiovascular risk? Hyperglycemia is dose dependently associated with increased cardiovascular risk. There is some evidence of an HbA1c target, but that evidence is less compelling. So if you're able to reduce the HbA1c of below 7%, go for it. But there is no doubt that glycemic control is significantly important in reducing microvascular disease, and you will need to reduce the target by below 7%. What about glycemic goals in kidney disease? There are no randomized control trials for advanced CKD. We know that the hyperglycemic risk is increased in patients with CKD. And we also question the precision of HbA1c in patients with advanced CKD due to increased red cell turnover. Nonetheless, the highest survival rates in CKD three to four are between a HbA1c of 6.5 to 8%, and in end-stage kidney disease between seven to 9%. So it's a U-shaped curve, too good a control or too bad a control, both are equally bad. A quick note on insulin prescribing in DKD. Insulin is degraded by the kidneys. So your insulin requirements drops as your CKD advances. Or in other words, if you're a stable patient with type 2 diabetes on insulin comes to you with hypoglycemia, please look at the patient's kidney functions. It's more than likely the kidney function would have dropped. What about oral hyperglycemic agents and GLP-1 receptor agonist in CKD? Glycoside can be used across all stages, but prefer not to use in CKD4 and 5 due to the risk of hypoglycemia. Metformin can be used up to a GFR of 30. Linagliptin can be used across all stages of CKD. Jardians can be used up to a GFR of 30. Foxiga can be used up to a GFR of 45 for diabetes, but for CKD and for 
heart failure, it can be used up to a GFR of 25. Trulicity and ozempic can be used up to a GFR of 15 mils per minute. In other words, if you are looking for cardiorenal protection and you are seeing a patient with a GFR below 30, then these are the agents to go to. So when GPs like yourself, cardiologist, endocrinologist, or nephrologist like me, or anyone really taking care of patients with diabetes is thinking about reducing cardiorenal risk in addition to blood pressure control, in addition to proteinuria reduction, in addition to lipid lowering therapy, we should be really looking at including SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist as an important tool in a toolbox to reduce cardiovascular risk. Now, all of these wonderful data that have accumulated with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonist, and all the guidelines that you've heard from me today are really of no value if they are not translated into clinical care. And I think that's our biggest enemy, inertia. Clinical inertia in diabetes is defined as a failure to initiate or intensify treatment in a timely manner in people with diabetes whose health is likely to improve with this intensification. Clinical inertia takes place across all stages of disease management, from screening and diagnosis, to advancing therapy, to adoption of new therapies and guidelines. So we see this in our practice all the time. He or she has mild diabetes. What is mild diabetes? Diabetes, unless someone develops retinopathy or nephropathy. My patient is stable on current therapy. We hear this often. Often the endocrinologist would tell you that this patient's HP1C is stable. There's no need to reduce insulin or add on a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGL2 inhibitor. Why should I change anything? It is inconvenient for him or her. It is more work for me. So just be cognizant that all of us do this and think about ways to overcoming clinical inertia as one of our biggest impediments in knowledge translation. No matter who we are in terms of a specialty, just think diabetes as an opportunity to reduce cardiovascular and renal risk. Thank you for your time. I look forward to the discussions in the Q&A session. Thank you, Bobby, for your very informative and comprehensive talk. That's lots to think about. So my name's Dr. Michelle Redford. I'm a GP in New Lambton, a suburb of Newcastle. And I'm just gonna pull a few things together, just some reflections on all that information that Bobby's given us, and then we'll move into the Q and A. I think really what struck me from your talk, Bobby, was that you know, that combination of diabetes with CKD really gives a person potentially a higher cardiovascular risk than if they've had a myocardial infarction. And I don't think necessarily as GPs or um, other colleagues working in primary care that we necessarily approach the consultation with those patients in that way. You know, you think about somebody who's just come out of hospital after an MI and you would be talking to them about stopping smoking and maybe using that moment as a moment to help them change their behavior. And you would be talking to them about um, cardiac rehab and making sure that they were on all the drugs that we know that they need to be on post MI. But when you've just had somebody's blood results back or their urine back showing that they've got a new diagnosis of CKD in the presence of type two diabetes, I could probably put my hand on my heart and say, I haven't necessarily approached those consultations in the same way. And I do think it's an opportunity to, um, as a clinician, think that this is a moment we need to take this seriously. This is a person who's at really high risk. And we've got some really good evidence about how we can help to protect their, their health going forward. As Bobby has said, you know, these are all things that we do every day as GPs and um, practice nurses. You know, we talk to people about um, nutrition and physical activity and stopping smoking and um, all of those sorts of things. And we also 
we are able to prescribe these medications. You know, we can make sure that they are on um, a renin angiotensin system um, medication. We can check their blood pressure. We can control their blood pressure. We can prescribe statins. And now, very clearly, we need to be thinking about SGLT2s as well. Now, the other thing that struck me from your talk, Bobby, and the translation into practice is this whole thing about the PBS, which, as you say, um, can hold us back a bit and act as a bit of a barrier because it's clear in the PBS that for an SGLT2, you need to have um, type 2 diabetes and an HbA1c of 7% or above. And there are obviously restrictions on which medications you can have in combination for um, PBS subsidy to apply, but maybe we'll talk a bit more about that um, as we um, as we enter into the Q and A. Um, one last thing I would um, comment on is about um, bringing all of this into practice. And what one thing we've done in our practice is that we've modified our care plan templates according to um, the kidney heat map, um, which Bobby talked about earlier and showed. And I do think that's a really great resource. The um, the CKD and primary care handbook. Um, it's really got very nice um, management plans if you're not very familiar with it. And they translate into the sorts of actions you might put in a care plan. So what we have now is we have a sort of CKD red care plan with all of those action points in and a CKD, CKD yellow care plan and a CKD amber care plan. Uh, all, uh, I think it's orange actually. Um, just to remind us, because there's actually so much information, isn't there, that you might be filtering through at a care planning appointment. And um, that just makes, it's just one little thing of translating it into practice might make it a bit easier. Anyway, we'll move on to questions and answers. And I think we've got lots of questions coming through on Slido. So um, hopefully Bobby's still there. Yeah. <laughs> Very much here, thank you. Wonderful. One question I had actually, Bobby, was can we just be really clear about what we do um, if we started an SGLT2 and say somebody's EGFR is 60 and we recheck it and it's dropped down to say 40. So, you know, how twitchy do we need to be? Um, so that goes back to my slide about the algorithm we're looking at. So we do expect a drop in GFR after you initiate an SGLT2 inhibitor. And it depends on the, the intensity of the drop will depend on what are the other drugs that this patient is on. So typically, if you see a GFR, GFR dropping from 60 down to 40, it's very likely that this patient is on the thiazide diuretic or any diuretic for that matter. So you may want to recheck the bloods in about three weeks time, remove the diuretic, and then if the patient's uh, GFR has, has picked up, then certainly should continue with the SGL2 inhibitor. The overarching goal, as I mentioned in my slide, is that we continue this drug. You have no idea how much this drug has transformed the management of diabetic kidney disease. So it's important that we persevere with this drug. You may want to take out some diuretics, so be it. But as much as possible, try and persevere with the SGL2 inhibitor. And as the guidelines have shown, as the kidney guidelines have shown, that if your GFR drops, that's not an indication to discontinue therapy. And I keep mentioning this, leave the GFR to us. Don't worry about it. So don't panic. No. Do what you can to make sure that they're not dried out and that you're not um, overdoing it with the diuretics. Keep that SGLT2 going um, as much as you possibly can. Keep a close eye on it and aim to keep them on it if you possibly can. That would be the the message about SGLT2s. What about, yeah. so we talk, you talked a bit about um, continuing SGLT2s if somebody's EGFR had dropped below the threshold, you know, below 30. What about initiating at that sort of level? That's a question come through on so, slide ice. So you can't initiate below 30. Uh, well, that's the current guidelines for Australia. Now that guidelines are likely to change. So for empagliflozin for Jardians, for diabetes, the target GFR, threshold GFR is 30. For Foxiga, that's 45 for diabetes, but for heart failure and the new indication for CKD, it goes down to 25. So it's very likely that as the months and years goes by, we will be seeing that that target is going to keep coming down. 
So okay. I don't think that should be a problem. But as a general rule, if you remember, 30 for diabetes and 25 for CKD, which is now TGA approved. So FOXIGA is now approved for the management of diabetic kidney disease and CKD without diabetes. Uh, but it depends on the uh, PBS approval, which is yet to come through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not on PBS for that indication at this stage. It's only on PBS yeah. for type 2 diabetes at this stage, but hopefully that will be something that we get in the future. Yes, a few questions coming through about navigating the PBS. Look, I think it is hard. I tend to use the um, Australian um, Diabetes Society little um, medication map, which does take you through which um, combinations of PBS subsidized and it changes so much it's not really information that I feel able to keep in my head and um, I just need to have the resource <laughs> ready to refer to when I'm beyond the sort of first couple generally Absolutely. you know I know that you can have metformin with everything and you can you know you can't have certain things with other things but it's not actually something that most of us are going to be keeping in our heads I think. Yeah, while you're on that algorithm, I need to mention about that um, algorithm that I mentioned about the use of GLP-1 with insulin. Now that has been changed. So you can use Trulicity with insulin. And I think just last week or two weeks ago, Ozempic can also be used with insulin. So GLP-1 is allowed to be used with insulin. Okay, so that's Ozempic and Exenatide. Because uh, it was always just Exenatide, wasn't it? So that's and that's and, right. and Trulicity as well. Perfect. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's helpful, but of course not SGLT twos with that lot. They're not PBS no, subsidised, I think. No, they're not. But uh, private script for an SGLT two inhibitor like Jardians will cost you about sixty dollars for a twenty five right. milligram yeah. tablet, and yeah. a regular PBS script will cost you about thirty dollars. So if you want to use this for your patients and you know that the drug is going to be helpful, you ask them to get a private script for $60 and cut down the tablet to 12.5 milligrams of Jardians for the patient. That way, at least you know that the patient is getting a SGLT2 inhibitor where it's actually required. And look, guidelines are guidelines. PBS is PBS. Uh, they have always lagged behind the rest of the world and hopefully they'll see some light. Yeah, we'll give it some time. And in the meantime, Absolutely. as you say, we can use private prescriptions for those who can manage that. Um, yeah. Another question that I had actually, um, have you got any, well, this is probably a bit off, off the cuff, sorry, um, Bobby, but have you got any additional information about um, patients who are indigenous? Um, are they, you know, the combination of CKD and diabetes presumably is associated with even more cardiovascular risk in that group? Much worse, much mm. worse. And and you could argue that uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists or even SGLT inhibitors should be used as a standard for this group of patients. So sort of, regardless of, what the, yeah. sort of yeah. regardless of what their HbA1c is or those sorts of things, you know? And yeah. that's a gap, Which isn't is it? What, that's a, yeah, exactly. And which is what's being practiced in Europe and may even also come to the US is that regardless of your HP1CA target is the expectation to use these agents. Yeah. So here for an SGLT2 be private script if your HP1C is six, but yeah. would still be doing that patient a lot of good. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a few questions. I'm just going to have a little flick through. Um, how is microalbuminuria treated for a type two diabetic patient who's currently pregnant? Not many agents you can um, use in pregnancy. No, well, you can't. The, the, the idea behind yeah. is that if you have type two diabetes and the patient is likely to fall pregnant, keep a watch on the urinacea maximize the use of RAS blockers, try and keep the urinacea down below 30 if you can, and then recommend falling pregnant. If you're not able to bring down the urinacea to a respectful level, try as much as possible with the maximum dose of RAS blocker. If you have an ACR of let's say 200 or 300, and then not giving them RAS blockers, but allowing them to fall pregnant, you are risking the kidney there. 
So you may want to hold off pregnancy, bring the ACR down, back off on the RAS blockers, fall pregnant, and then hope for a good outcome. But as soon as they deliver, my recommendation would be is avoid breastfeeding and go back straight on a RAS blocker, or you can give drugs like an Aleptil, which can still be used with breastfeeding, try to mitigate proteinuria. I think that's that's the focus that I would like to place on people that don't just get fooled by the GFR. Excellent. And I think, um, you know, that thing about the urine, it's always the thing that gets missed, isn't it? So I know when I worked in the UK, I, I was involved in some um, analysis of national diabetes audit there. And quite often the item that was missed most, actually the eye screening and the urine, because they weren't things that were done there and then, you know, your patient comes in, they get weighed, they get their blood pressure done. Actually in the UK, you get they take your bloods and things at the same time but the urine was easily missed so so my practice now is if they haven't done it then they have to do just a spot one never mind it's not early morning at least we've got something better than get better to get a any old time one than a perfect one i suppose is that fair enough approach bobby absolutely when they come to the clinic get a hold of the urine straight away don't wait for a first morning sample if your first sample is positive then you need to confirm that with the first word sample. But opportunistic testing is yeah. great and by then, behind it. Yeah. yeah, and by then we may have actually got them on board a bit more with the need to do a urine because you've yeah. got an abnormal result. And so I think you may have a more engaged patient at that stage. Um, I'm just looking through some of these other things. Oh, I had a little thing about um, absolute cardiovascular risk. And I um, hear your point about um, these items not being included in our absolute cardiovascular risk calculators in Australia. Um, the one that links through from our clinical software is that same one um, and doesn't count any of those other items. And it also doesn't tell you if your patient is automatically at high cardiovascular risk. And so, you know, so like your EGFR of 45 or less, where they're automatically high cardiovascular risk according to the um, Australian guidelines. So you're in a potential situation where you might calculate them as not being high risk. Does that make sense? It's a very strange, um, it's, it's a very, very strange application of the evidence because it, it could be misleading actually if you calculate it through the clinical software that um, someone's cardiovascular risk might come out at 7% or something and they've got, you know, microalbuminuria, so they're automatically high risk. I don't know what we Absolutely. do about that. I mean, <laughs> no, no, we, we, we sort of, again, very focused on the cardiac side of things. We get focused on the diabetes side of things and then we get focused on the CKD in, in their own little silos. I think um, the way I look at this CKD I mean, though it is chronic kidney disease, it's cardio kidney diabetes. And if you start looking at it as an entity, you're likely to do good for your patients. Hmm. And I think, you know, in general practice, then the, you know, the mechanism for that really is care planning and, you know, to have that dedicated time to sit down. And it really, that isn't a diabetes care plan or a kidney care plan. That should take into account all the different elements and a lot of those will overlap won't they so i think if we can get that right then that should be the force for change and it's a good opportunity to then run through you know which drugs you've got and which drugs you might be missing here's a question saying if cost is not an issue would you recommend Jardiance and Trigenta instead of metformin and Trigenta for a patient with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk with an hpa1c of 6.8 Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Agenda is not doing much in terms of cardiorenal protection. It's glycemic control. And again, not as much as you would want to. So from, from my perspective, metformin is the go-to drug. It still remains as your go-to drug, but your next agent after metformin, if you can, if your HB1C permits, it has to be an SGLT2 inhibitor for cardiorenal protection. If the HB1C does not allow, and the patient is allowed to do a, a can afford a private script, go for the private script if you think that the cardiorenal protection is important here. Excellent, yeah. Um, just looking through. Um, somebody is asking, what is the mechanism of renal protection by SGLT2? Um, so that also goes back to the slide that I did 
think I showed that slide on the on the physiology of uh, renal disease in diabetes with the afferent arterial vasodilatation and the efferent arterial vasoconstriction that happens in diabetes. The RAS blockers act on the efferent arterial vasoconstriction alone, while the SGLT2 inhibitor uh, reverses the afferent arterial vasodilatation, and that together reduces the hyperfiltration uh, inside the kidneys. So that's the most recognized uh, mechanism that SGLT2 inhibitors leads to renal protection. And if there is a recording of this session, so you can actually go back to that slide and, and show that again. Excellent. Okay. The other thing I would say about when I start somebody on SGLT2 is I always give them a written handout. I've got a nice one yep. from South Australia that I, that I use. I haven't found any other ones. Just about that whole stopping, stopping it for three days before surgery, these kind of little tips. Yep. And I just make a, make a big song and dance about the um, ketoacidosis, even though we know that it's not a common thing, just because... I want people to be able to seek medical attention if they get those sorts of symptoms. I don't know if you've got a handy handout or something that you would <laughs> recommend. Or... We so, love a handout in general practice, or it might just be me, but I love a handout. Yeah, I know. I guess, I guess it's important. And, and as far as the DK in the hospital setting is concerned, we were one of the first to actually publish the data uh, locally here, which led to the warning from... Um, from the Australian guidelines recommending that this drug needs to be stopped for three days prior to initiating any surgery. Um, with the newer agents like ertegliflozin, it's likely that you need longer periods for these agents to be discontinued. So there's a lot to take in, um, mm. but my recommendation is, and, and for the companies like Boringer and AstraZeneca to come out with handbooks. We know that with empagliflozin, they have the Jardians booklet, which I give it to all my patients when they start on this medication, and that has got very useful information. And I'm sure AstraZeneca has a similar book on Foxiga that the patient will need to read about a little handbook about uh, what other precautions to be taken. But by and large, the precautions uh, pertains to sick day medication. I think as GPs and, and as specialists, we need to uh, stress upon our patients the idea of sick day medications. It's not just SGLT2 inhibitors. It's about metformin. It's about diuretics. It's about RAS blockers that they need to be withheld on sick days. Just make it as a habit. Yeah. So that's another thing that can come up in a you know care plan type appointment, isn't it? It's just reviewing sick day rules. I know certainly in our kind of um, our autofills and templates that we use um, in diabetes. So that's. Um, that's another one just to make sure you're covering. I'm just having a look at some other these questions. Some of them are very specific. We sort of might need sham. I don't know some of these. Um, let's have a look. So um, for a type 2 diabetic patient who has an EGFR less than 25 and treating with insulin, what is the recommending re recommendation regarding adjusting insulin dosage and monitoring of EGFR? Now, you did talk a little, oh, so do we actively increase insulin doses to improve patients' glycemic control? So you did talk a bit about some cautions with adjusting insulin at a yeah. low EGFR. That's right. I think and those questions came up within the first 15 minutes of my talk, but my mm -hmm. last 30 <laughs> minutes of my talk covered all that aspects of the questions, I would imagine. Yeah. There was one specific question so. asking about lipid control with the use of ezetimide. And now I think that's a very interesting and oh, a yeah. very important question. Um, so statins, so when you have lipids deranged in patients, uh, you start off with statins. And if the lipid control has not been achieved, then your options basically are to increase the dose of statins, which in the context of CKD could be tricky because there's a risk of myopathy. That's where this agent comes into play. The acetamide acts complementary to statins. So statins inhibit the hepatic biosynthesis, whereas acetamide inhibits the cholesterol uptake in the gut. So you could use a lower dose of statin and use acetamide to try to get the same benefit of LDL lowering as you would do with a higher dose of statin, which will increase the risk of myopathy. So that's where the role of that agent comes into place. And um, PBS subsidized, I've just quickly checked. PBS subsidized if you've got type 2 diabetes and microalbuminuria. It's There's a whole long list. It's a bit of a complicated one to navigate that. But um, yes, if you've got type 2 diabetes and you're age 60 or over, or you've got um, microalbuminuria with it, then it's subsidized. So. 
and it's also there's a question sort of about matches. It does. Um, so, Michelle, there's also a question about the combination of SGLT2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, intuitively, you begin to think that these agents are going to work complementary to each other, and it's very likely in the future we're going to use this combination a lot more. Uh, are there any trials? There are no specific trials. There's a meta-analysis of the various trials that have looked, and they found that there is a beneficial effect combining these two agents together in terms of their HP1C lowering effect, the weight loss effect, and the effect on blood pressure. But whether it would translate into cardiorenal protection in the future it remains to be seen. We don't have any long-term data, but it would make sense that that's how you should be using these agents together in the future. And this is a, another very specific question. So a patient with type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, um, bypass and left toe amputation and vascular surgery with episode of hypoglycemia, which one would you stop? And it's out of empagliflozin, metformin or gelaglutide. So that's true, this is it? Yes, so that's someone who's on both question. of those two agents. <laughs> so that's someone yes, who's on an SGLT2. So yeah, so she's it would be very unusual, actually. Yeah. Exactly. I would be very surprised. So the one thing that that question is missing is that they have not looked at the kidney function. So if that's what the problem is happening, you might want to look at the patient's kidney function here. Um, metformin, geloglutide, and empagliflozin together. Uh, I don't think that they were led to hyperglycemia, but uh, the geloglutide or tulicity would probably be the stronger one of the three agents that would potentially be the one that's causing the hyperglycemia. So you may want to back off on that. Uh, but eventually you need to see what is the ultimate outcome you want to. So if the kidney disease is a problem here, then you may want to keep with the empagliflozin. But if it's ischemic heart disease and cuneatory bypass graft, you may want to keep the diluglutide on board because that is an atherosclerotic event and you want to keep a GLP-1 on board. Excellent. So I think after this, I might go and um, do a couple of audits in my practice and find all my um, diabetic patients with CKD and see what drugs they're on. Hey, see if they're on SGLT2, make sure they're on some um, angiotensin receptor blocker or um, ACE inhibitor and um, see what I can do about them, especially if they're indigenous. Hey, absolutely. So I think we're pretty much there. Um, Charles, is that? Yep, that's. Are we pretty much so one time minute. up? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, that's okay. All good. Perfect timing. Thank you so much, Michelle and Bobby, uh, for presenting tonight and preparing your content. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our partners and sponsors without whom this masterclass series would not be possible. Um, and thank you, of course, to all of you at home who have joined us um, and given your time to participate in tonight's education. So a reminder, um, all the previous recordings of these uh, webinars um, are available in the MindTract app. Um, tonight's uh, presentation, so Bobby's presentation and the Q&A will be separately available in the MindTract Mind app. Um, and the whole presentation will be available in in the Hunter New England Central Coast PHN Education Library on our website. Uh, we would love your feedback about tonight. You'll see that I've posted the link to the survey in, um, in the chat box that it should be sitting up the top for you. Um, you'll also be sent an email though later tonight from the MindTrack team, which will have the survey link. So keep an eye out for that. Reminder that you must complete the survey to receive your certificate and please allow up to around a week for that to arrive. Um, we, of course, encourage you to share this series still with your colleagues. It's not too late, even though we're getting to the tail end. And next Monday is uh, the team from Nepean Blue Mountains Local Health District and that region's primary health network. will run the final night of the series. And the topic for that is diabetes in aged care and mental health. So uh, that's all from us. A big thank you again to Bobby and Michelle for joining us. Um, and we hope that you all have a safe and enjoyable evening. Good night.